Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Christoph, uh, Matthew, and uh, Katharina uh, for uh, accepting this paper into the program. It's really a fantastic conference. I mean, we have people talking about different aspects of uh, tokenomics and blockchain, and also I'm looking forward to tomorrow's uh, session where we are going to hear more from the practitioners. Uh, so th this paper is really uh, about platform. Uh, but we are not going to flesh out a lot of these details like two-sided market, for instance. What we are going to focus on <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> is more a dynamic investment and financing model for the platform. So digital platform uh, is playing an increasingly important role in our life. And increasingly, we, we, we see that uh, payment innovation is very important. And what is recent is uh, uh, tokenomics. Basically, we see the digital platforms start to introduce tokens as the local currency on the platform. <clears throat> this is not something that we, we see in China because um, the Chinese government is not allowing any private entity to issue, issue money. But we do see uh, a lot of other platforms start to issue their own fiat currency. It's not backed. So here we are not talking about tokens that are redeemable for goods and services from the platform. This is just a utility token that settles transactions among the uh, platform users. You can think about Filecoin as an example. Uh, you can think about basic attention token. Uh, basically, the platforms we have in mind is, uh, is online, market, uh, online marketplace where people can, uh, can treat uh, uh, goods and services of a particular kind. Basically, the platform will serve a niche market. You know, Filecoin is for transacting the digital space and uh, basic attention coin is, is to buy people's attention, right? You download their browser, you see some advertisement, you get paid with tokens. And advertisers use the tokens to pay for uh, the advertising space. So basically uh, what we have in mind is really an analogy between a token-based platform and a country, right? A country can have a currency, a platform can have a currency. And like a country can issue currency to finance investment, infrastructure, uh, for instance, a uh, platform can also issue tokens to finance its development. Uh, in 2018, the total token-based financing is uh, in a comparable magnitude with uh, venture capital. But uh, in 2019, we see uh, quite a freeze of token-based financing. And this only begs the, the question, you know, what really defines token-based financing? And, and what is special about bundling the, the usage of token as means of payment among users? and as uh, a finance instruments uh, among, uh, uh, for, the, for the platforms. So basically we can see that uh, you know, empirically this is what we observe, right? Tokens are used to, to gather resources. Uh, they are paid to investors in exchange for, uh, for their uh, dollars. And then you can use dollars to, to buy all kinds of resources. Or you can just use tokens to buy resources uh, directly. You can pay engineers, consultants with tokens. And the tokens enter into circulation gradually. So we do have a lot of papers uh, focusing on ICO, where tokens enter into circulation once for all. But this is not what we're observing uh, in reality, right? We see tokens are gradually paid to uh, people who can contribute to the platform, and tokens are gradually paid to the founding entrepreneurs. So it's really a very dynamic process. And the, in this paper, we, we want to understand it. We want to understand from the uh, platform owner's perspective, what is the optimal token supply policy? And what is the associated uh, platform uh, development, i.e. investment policy, and what are the potential inefficiencies? So we are going to uh, basically build a model. Uh, everything is uh, surrounding uh, token. Uh, users use token to settle transactions. Uh, and we are going to model in a very reduced form, uh, following the money utility tr uh, tradition. And uh, of course, users will speculate on tokens. Uh, their expectation of future token price matters. This is about the token demand. And then you have the token supply determined by the platform owners who basically have two considerations, okay? If I issue more tokens, I can issue to, to myself. And then I can sell tokens in the secondary market for the consumption goods and then uh, you know, I can have a good time. Uh, that's my utility. Or I can issue new tokens to the potential resource contributors and improve the platform. And, and then basically the uh, dynamic programming is going to maximize uh, the present value of a token a platform owner's rewards 
uh, that we can think about as a synergy. So here you are also going to see something like a laffer curve. Okay, you, you don't want to issue too too many tokens to flood the market, reduce token price, i.e., reducing the token payout value for the for the owners. But on the other hand, you don't want to issue too little because you want to. Uh, compensate the owners, but at the same time, you want to issue tokens to gather resources uh, for the platform's improvement. So this graph is basically the model. So if you do not uh, uh, remember any of the notations, I mean, the time is short. I'm going to go through this very fastly anyway. Just remember this graph. So we try to capture all these elements endogenously uh, in a coherent fashion. So we think about the model itself is, uh, is sort of a conceptual contribution because once we lay out a formal model, it makes really the, the, the discourse very clear, right? We can point our finger and say, okay, this is what you are interested in we are studying it, and this is what you are interested in Well, you know, we take as exogenous. So here we see <clears throat> the platforms can issue new tokens. Uh, to the contributors and the contributors, they can just sell tokens in the secondary market for consumption goods. So that's how they get compensated. Uh, the platform owners can also issue new tokens to themselves as payoffs. Uh, and also, of course, you, you have the ultimate token owner, the users, right? They hold the tokens to settle transaction and also they speculate. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize is that we do allow the platform owners to reduce token supply. So they can use consumption goods to buy back tokens. Reduce token supply, support token price. Why they want to do that? Because they are concerned about their continuation value, their franchise value. A lot of their uh, value is derived from future token-based payout. So they do not want the token supply to be too high, the token price to be too low, and they, they basically want to dynamically manage the, the token price a little bit through both issuance and token buyback. All right. So some basic questions we were after. Uh, the first one is that, well, if you want, if you issue a digital token, right, the marginal cost is zero. It is digital. If you want to issue, you issue. And then why the token price can be positive? Why don't you just uh, issue an infinite amount of tokens and drive the token price to zero? Uh, if you think, if you think about tokens, right, they are, they are very similar to durable goods. If you issue more, you increase the, the supply. Well, you can reverse it in the model. But uh, we are going to assume there is a cost. You, basically, it's a financing cost. You use uh, consumption goods to buy back tokens. It's costly because you, you need to raise external finance. So it's costly reversible. And therefore, once you increase token supply, it's uh, somewhat permanent, right? So that, that's why you think uh, tokens and, uh, and the durable goods, they, they have an analogy. But then, you know, from the Cauchy uh, hypothesis, we, we know that if the marginal production of these tokens zero, then the equilibrium price, the only equilibrium price we can expect is zero. So why, why don't we say zero? So what, what, I, what we are going to show you is that, uh, well, the uh, franchise value really imposes a discipline against excessive uh, uh, issues. But where the franchise value comes from, it really comes from the, the dynamic development of the platform. It is getting better and better. So basically, the platform owners are very patient. They want to milk the users gradually, and they want to wait when the future plat uh, when, the, when, the, when the platform is more productive in the future, and then we are going to look into the value chain. Here you have the users who derive value ultimately uh, by holding tokens, and then you have the platform who can issue token for uh, for development and and payout. Uh, so where where things go wrong uh, in this value chain? So we are going to identify the potential inefficiency. We are going to introduce a concept called to token overhead. And this is where we build the analogy between corporate finance and, uh, and the tokenomics. And finally, there's uh, the role of blockchain technology. Uh, we have a conflict of interest between users and platforms, as you will see. Uh, very naturally, there's a dynamic inconsistency. Uh, like when you talk about fiscal policy and monetary policy, right? Basically, you have a one big player facing a continuum of small players. There's dynamic inconsistency. We also see it here, right? You have a platform, and then you have a, a lot of users. Uh, and then that's how blockchain can add value because you can use decentralized consensus uh, to enable some commitment. All right, so I'm going to skip the literature review and dive directly into the model. So here we have a platform. Uh, well, the platform is uh, um, captured by this AT variable. Right now, you can just take it at, you know, it's a snapshot, okay? We just uh, think about uh, AT's current value and then think about how users can derive value from token holdings. As I said before, right, it's just the money utility. So the real balance of tokens, that is the KIT units of token, multiply the token price PT in terms of the numerator consumption goods. 
So XIT is the real balance of tokens. It goes into the flow utility of token holdings. And what else? There's also the user network effect, NT, that's the total number of users that go into the convenience yield, the flow utility of token holdings. And then you have the user heterogeneity captured by UI. Of course, users care about token appreciation. Uh, individual users, they are atomic, so they take as given the equilibrium token price dynamics. Here, the mu PT and sigma PT, they are all endogenous. We are going to solve it. Uh, but users take as given, right? So the users know that given KIT units of tokens they hold, uh, they are exposed to price uh, fluctuation. Uh, if it's appreciation, they like it. If it's depreciation, it's a negative term. They don't like it. So we introduced the participation cost. That's phi dt. Uh, why we do that, that's how we pin down the user base. Uh, because only the users with sufficiently high UI, uh, they participate. And the particip participation threshold can be potentially time varying, and that is U low of RT. Uh, and then NT is the user base. GT is the distribution of, uh, of UI, the cumulative distribution. Users basically want to maximize the, the net return from tokens, uh, including convenience yield and also the expected price appreciation minus participation cost. And then eventually you are going to get the token demand, which is a linear in UI that helps to do the aggregation. Uh, some basic properties. Uh, if, we, if the users expect the token to, uh, to appreciate over time, and then they want to hold more tokens, okay? That's the second inequality. If the, if the platform is very good, okay, AT is high, uh, of course, the users derive a high flow utility from holding tokens. Uh, you can think about this, well, the, the, the pl platform is really serving very important economic transactions, okay? So the users want to hold these tokens to settle some transaction. And it's more convenient to hold tokens than the whole US dollars. So that's where the convenience yield, the flow utility comes from. Uh, why this is so, may, maybe if the platform uh, settles to, uh, transactions using token uh, and then you hold the dollars, uh, you have to do the, the exchange, right? You have to sell dollars, buy the tokens, there might be some transaction cost. Or maybe token is just a programmable money and it just has more functions. So you want to hold tokens. And maybe tokens can serve as collateral in a smart contracting uh, setting, and then that's why you want to hold tokens. So we model it in a very reduced form. But uh, the general idea is that when the users expect token price to appreciate, they hold more. And when the platform is better, they hold more. So we can do the token market clearing. MT is the total outstanding amount of tokens. And then uh, basically once we have the market clearing condition, uh, we immediately say that, okay, here we, we can characterize a Markovian system, okay? taking AT, the platform's productivity, and MT, the total outstanding supply of tokens as the two state variables. And then this token market clearing condition basically gives us a, a differential equation for token price. And that's how we can solve the drift and diffusion, okay? Uh, basically, the, all these slides uh, summarize, uh, su summarize the, the, the user side. So now let me talk about how the uh, state variables evolve over time. So first, the platform can, can become better. Okay, here is the growth rate of the uh, productivity. It depends on the resources that you, that you gather, that LT, you will pay for with tokens. And then there's a, a productivity shock. Okay, so DHT is basically a normal random variable. Uh, well, we can think about this as coming from entrepreneurs' initial uh, contribution to the platform, how the platform is designed, etc. We take that as exogenous. Why? Because we have a lot of papers that describe uh, entrepreneurs' contribution, entrepreneurs' effort, moral hazard problem before the launching of the platform. But this paper is about after the launching. It's about uh, resources from decentralized contributors, not the entrepreneur. Okay, so here we differentiate, uh, differentiate ourselves from the, from the literature. So if you want to get LT, you better pay the contributors. We are not going to model the optimization of the contributors. We just assume that the contributors, they want F, LT, NT, this amount of goods. But you pay the contributors in tokens, right? So F divided by PT, that's how you get the units of tokens. And when you pay more tokens to the contributors, you know, you get the resources, but you also increase token supply. This tends to depress the token price. So now you can see the trade-off. Uh, DT is the cumulative tokens paid to, uh, to the owner. So uh, if we take the differential, right, that's the instantaneous payoff. If the owners receive uh, payout, uh, token supply increase, right? But uh, the, to uh, the, the, the platform owners, they can, they can burn tokens. They can uh, buy tokens out of the circulation using consumption goods. 
And that is when a uh, small d, big dt is negative, and that's how you reduce token supply. So LT and DT, basically, these are two control variables of the platform, and that's how the platform's uh, you know, decisions can, in, in, can impact the uh, evolution of state variables. The objective function here uh, captures the payout, that's the first term here, and also it captures the external financing cost. If you want to buy back tokens, you need to risk external financing. Okay, there's a proportional cost kind. And uh, the basic property of this value function is that uh, the platform's value, uh, or the owner's value, to be more precise, is going to be lower if there are more tokens circulating. Why? Because this depresses the token price. Remember, the, the payout that the platform owners get is in tokens, right? If the token price in numerator goods is lower, then the value for the platform owners is, is lower. So that this is also the, the disciplinary effect that, that we, we talk about, okay? When we see more token supply, you see a lower value of the uh, platform owners, so that's how they, they, they really resist against excessive uh, token supply. And then when the platform is better, okay, you see the platform uh, owner's value is higher. Okay, so this, uh, this slide basically summarize uh, all, all the ingredients here. All the user side of the bells and whistles just give us a token market clearing condition that connect the state variables with the indulgence token price. And then uh, all the platform side, you can think about that's how the token pri price involves driven by, uh, driven by state variables and how the state variables MT and AT involve driven by the platform's decisions. Uh, eventually, uh, we have a homogeneity uh, property. Uh, the, the, the ratio of token supply to plat platform productivity uh, drives a lot of uh, uh, actions, especially token price. And, uh, and then we have some, uh, some results I want to talk about. So first, there is a strong energy between durable goods and tokens. Um, and, uh, and we know that durable goods producers, they are always tempted to meet the residual demand, right? They face heterogeneous uh, consumers, some value their goods more, some value the, their goods less, like UI in the model, right? Um, but the problem is that uh, b b because the, 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 you, the customers expect the uh, platform or the producer, the seller, to decrease price over time to meet the residual, de residual demand, uh, they will wait uh, for the price to get lower, uh, and then they will buy. But here, the uh, residual demand uh, has a marginal value of token equal to zero, right? That's when UI equal to zero. And uh, the marginal production, uh, uh, marginal cost of production for, for token is zero. So you can just uh, issue tokens. So why do we see the token price is still positive? Uh, well, the, the quotient conjecture predicts zero. The key idea is that here, uh, the, the token demand is not stationary. If we see different formalizations of the quotient hypothesis, uh, the, token, the, the demand for durable good is always stationary. But here we see the AT grows ge geometrically through token financed investment, uh, the LT, and that's, uh, that's uh, where we see the token demand is going to be higher in the future, right? As a result, the platform owners, they are willing to wait uh, to issue more tokens in the future uh, right, rather than right now, and therefore to, uh, to, to keep the token supply in a, in a controlled path and the, uh, without depressing the token, token price too much. Okay, I'm going to skip the intuition on real option, uh, but the basic idea is that uh, the, uh, the state variable, um, the productivity adjusted token supply is basically bounded by two indulgence boundaries. On the right boundary, uh, that's when supply is too high, that's when you burn the tokens. You are willing to pay the, issue, uh, the financing cost in order to boost the franchise value. Uh, we see a lot of durable goods producers, they also burn their, their products, right? There's an energy here. And uh, uh, if, if the token su supply is low relative to uh, AT, the productivity, uh, that's when you pay the token uh, dividend to the, to the platform owners. All right, so here I want to see where the inefficiency comes from uh, when, when we have this token-based financing. Uh, well, here you have the investment pay paid by new tokens. Uh, if the investment successfully increase AT, well, this will increase users' flow utility. Uh, so I see a, a question in the chat room. Okay, five minutes left, no problem. All right, so the question is, well, can the platform seize all the surplus from investment? And the answer is no, because users are heterogeneous, and we have one token price that appears in the market. So basically, only the marginal user, remember the U lower bar T, okay, the threshold guy, only this guy breaks even. Anybody with a UI higher than the threshold will keep a positive surplus. 
So, so far, we are considering making investment, AT go up, that's good for users, right? But we have shocks in the model. So what if the, uh, there's a negative shock? Remember, you get LT, but then you need to multiply a, a normal random variable that's a productivity shock, and then you see whether the platform is going to be better or, or worse, right? So if it, there, there's a negative shock, then you see the, the state of variable empty uh, increase instead of decrease because you see a smaller denominator. And then that's when you get closer to the token buyback boundary, the upper bound, right? But at the upper bound, to, to burn tokens out of circulation, to reduce token supply, and maintain kind of in the target range, right? That's the, what the platform owners want. There is external financing cost. So the, the downside is basically borne totally by the platform owners. That, that is the external financing cost. But the upside is shared uh, with the users. So of course, there's conflict of interest, right? So in other words, uh, th this will translate into the platform's underinvestment. Because every time the platform decides whether I want to issue new tokens to make investment, this loop comes into their mind, okay? And, and then the platform uh, owners will think, okay, I should just uh, issue a little bit less and invest a little bit less. But here we have the dynamic inconsistency because exactly the platform owners would rather commit themselves to, to a little bit high investment rate because high investment rate means faster trajectory of AT growth. This means a higher value uh, that users can derive from token holdings. This means stronger token demand. And this in turn means higher token price and a higher value of payout to the platform owners uh, through the token-based payout, right? However, this exactly optimization uh, is not go is going is going to be uh, uh, destroyed, exposed once the platform owners, you know, take into consideration this issue, you know, the, the, the this loop here, and then they are going to uh, to negate on the commitment. This is a typical dynamic inconsistency. So here is how the blockchain can add value. So basically, you can write an investment rule like this. You know, there's a constant growth rate of token supply, and this part of growth is all going to the investment. And then you can increase the, the exempted value of the owners uh, by quite a lot. I mean, I'm not going to take this number seriously. The whole model is, is about qualitative uh, predictions, uh, but, but we do characterize one channel where uh, the blockchain can, can add value by enabling commitment. So the model basically try to uh, try to uh, conceptualize a token-based ecosystem system where a lot of actions are endogenous. And uh, here we want to emphasize token. It's not just durable good. You need to really think about the non-stationarity of demand and, uh, uh, and, and how this can, can induce a discipline against uh, excessive token supply on the part of the platform owners. And then, uh, you know, if we uh, put on the uh, head of uh, corporate finance, uh, a guy, and then we see that there is this particular type of token overhead. Whenever you invest, uh, the surplus is, is going to be shared by the with the token users, and that's why you see underinvestment. And even if the token market is perfectly liquid, here we have a perfectly liquid token market. There's no moral hazard. There's no friction other than the external financing cost for token buyback. But that is enough to to get this uh, uh, token overhead and the conflict of interest as a result. Uh, can be can be uh, mediated by uh, uh, mitigated by uh, uh, the blockchain if uh, the uh, platform can commit to an investment policy. Exactly. Thanks.